one of the most important exam issues that's often tested at macro level is the, the debate, the discussion about GDP and economic well-being. So I thought I'd spend a few minutes looking at three aspects of GDP and well-being. And here's the challenge. Give me three limitations of GDP as a measure of economic well-being. Well, one measure, one limitation of the, pe the published GDP is that GDP measures the total value of goods and services produced and spending on it in the economy. It only tends to measure the value of market transactions, the things that have a price in the market. And it tends to ignore non-market activities. Good examples might include the value of people who are looking after an ill relative, caregiving, people who volunteer regularly for charities and other organisations, and critically, of course, the informal labour market. In some countries, informal labour can be a very high percentage of people in work. It doesn't necessarily get picked up by the GDP statistics. Now, we know that well-being is a much broader concept than that, and non-market activities such as volunteering and informal labour can, uh, people's engagement within communities can really generate that sense of uh, participatory uh, activities and the sense that life is worthwhile. Another aspect is that GDP does not account for environmental damage and resource depletion. So it could be the case that GDP per capita is going up in a country, national output is rising, the economy is growing, but it's the consequence of rapid extraction of finite resources or the loss of natural capital, such as a long-term decline in biodiversity. And of course, all of this can contribute to climate change, which ultimately, as we know, threatens sustainability. And a third really key aspect is that GDP uh, is not necessarily an accurate measure of well-being because GDP per capita, income per head, does not measure the distribution of income or wealth. So it tends to mask growing inequality. So GDP, for example, does not account for social cohesion. A country might have a rising GDP, but still have significant social problems with high relative poverty, or with crime and social unrest. Here's an interesting chart showing uh, mean and median real disposable incomes of individuals in the UK. So let's quickly go through this. This is mean income, income per capita. It's measured in real terms, so we take out the effects of inflation. And it also takes out the effects of direct taxes and welfare benefits, so it's disposable incomes. And you can see that over the period since 1988, clearly, and you would hope it's the case, that m mean real incomes have gone up in the UK. But in fact, they've plateaued since the global financial crisis from 2007-2008. There has been an improvement since 2012, but mean real disposable incomes have not grown very quickly at all. Median have grown less quickly as well. You see that growing gap between the mean and the median. Of course, the mean is skewed by the super high incomes of people at the top of the income distribution. A lot of economists now think that if we're measuring well-being, instead of measuring GDP per capita, we should focus instead on median real disposable incomes. And that chart shows income. This chart shows wealth. Have a look at this chart. This shows household wealth in the UK by percentiles. We split the population up into 100 percentiles. Now, the data is from 2018 through to the spring of 2020, of course, the start of the pandemic. It's the latest data I have. And I think the chart does show the extremities of wealth inequality in the UK. That people at the 25th percentile have an average wealth of just over £70,000. People at the 50th percentile have an average wealth of over just over £300,000. Much, of course, of that is built into... Um, property uh, with a little bit of savings as well, whereas people at the 99th or 100th percentile have a, have a, have a, have a wealth in excess of 3.6 million. Wealth in terms of property, in terms of savings, stocks and shares and other marketable assets. The inequality in wealth is shown by that chart. Now, when it comes to questions, exam questions on economic well-being living standards, perceptions of well-being are clearly influenced by cultural values and society's prevailing social norms. And those norms can change over time, of course. What we do know is that economic well-being is not just about income or wealth. It's about quality of life. It's about uh, years of healthy life expectancy. It's about access to key 
public services, such as a good school, a GP surgery, an NHS dentist. And it's also about opportunities for personal and social development. So measures of well-being now do include some subjective assessments of happiness. People are asked questions over time. They have longitudinal studies. How worthwhile do you feel your life is? On average, how, uh, how, how well off? Or what's your, your state of mental health? And so on and so forth. And increasingly, we're using evidence from those surveys to try to capture changes in well-being. And, and I think this is super important. Well-being is a much broader, holistic concept than that measured by GDP per capita. It's influenced by access to social capital. What we mean by that is your networks of close friends, family, community support, which can certainly also affect economic outcomes and opportunities. Isolation, loneliness, is a, a pandemic in the UK, but it also has an economic as well as a, a human cost. So there we go, a quick look at the debate about GDP and economic well-being. Hope you found it useful.